Hello, everyone. Today, we have a guest with us. We have Dr. Taylor Burrowes. I've known Dr. Taylor ever since 2018. I came across her Twitter account right when I started Life Math Money. Taylor is a relationship coach, a family counselor, and she used to be a therapist. She has a PhD and, well, she is a doctor, like I said. A couple of years ago, I came across a thread that she wrote where she expressed regret for picking a career over a family and how she wishes to save other women from making the same mistakes. I have over 50,000 female followers on Twitter and many more on other platforms. And every once in a while, I'll have one of them reach out to me asking a question like, should I get married or should I work hard in my career now and figure out all the marriage and children stuff later? I thought it would be more interesting to have a first-hand account from a woman who has gone through the same problem and her experience rather than just me doing a solo podcast. Because when a guy gives advice to women, they sometimes tend to disregard it. So this is from a woman to women. I have spoken enough. How are you doing, Taylor? (laughs) I'm doing very well, Harsh. Thanks for having me on your podcast. I'm glad to have you here. So can you tell us a bit about yourself just to introduce you to people who might not know you? Absolutely. Just to clarify, I am a retired therapist, marriage and family therapist, mental health counselor. So I've been working for myself online as a coach, consultant, matchmaker even. And yeah, I live in the States now, but uh, my partner and I, we like to, to travel. We were always planning to be digital nomads and have that flexibility. And so we, we're here now because uh, we're close to family and that's our primary focus, but still still working, <laughs> you know, uh, that might uh, decline as other priorities are present. But for now, I'm still working pretty actively online. I have a, a strong caseload, like a, a roster of clients, about 20 individual clients, group coaching, and I do email coaching as well, which I can talk about later if you like. Yeah, I would love to hear about that. So tell us a bit about the thread I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. I could read it, but I think it would be better if you speak about it in your own words. Yeah, you you might have to read it to to recall exactly what I said, but I can speak to the concept because I'm living it. (laughs) Basically, um, you know, I chose to prioritize my career. And looking back, Uh, I would say that there were the factors involved in my motivation for doing that. It included a lot of pain. I lost my father and my brother quite young. So my brother, uh, I was 17 when he died. Suddenly he died in his sleep and he was a very healthy military man. He was in the Navy and he was in the Gulf War and he was very prominent amongst his peers. He was also an Olympic swimmer. He qualified for the Canadian Olympic team and then chose to join the Navy instead. So it was a surprise when he died that way, and we really didn't get a proper answer as to what happened. So we suspect it was what people call Gulf War syndrome, which had nothing to do, someone assumed it was like death by suicide, but it wasn't that. It was the physiological impact of chemical warfare on on military personnel that were exposed during that time. And they didn't really know a lot about it then, but a lot of the same people who died in their sleep in this, in, like in, in that way were in the Gulf War. So we think there is some connection, but there was nothing confirmed anyway. So I was quite I'm young. sorry when, to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. It was pretty traumatic. So I'm just trying to provide some context of, uh, I guess, where my head was at. And uh, my father was very... He was elderly because he had me when he was 66. So when I was a teenager, he was getting up there in age. And even though he was very physically fit, his mental health declined when we moved him out of his home. Like he was from the the islands. He was Jamaican. And then we moved to the Cayman, or they moved to the Cayman Islands when I came into the picture. So he lived there his whole life, his whole life. I mean, other than going to school in England, he was a, a, a Rhodes Scholar from Oxford. And he was in the military as well. But we moved him to Miami, very isolated, with nothing to do. He had to retire from his practice and move to Miami to support 
me going to school in the States. And so his mental health started to decline. That was a bad choice. I think he would have persevered for a bit longer if he had stayed in his environment. But he developed Alzheimer's pretty severely. And it was quite hard. So losing my brother kind of triggered it all. Uh, My mother came down with breast cancer. And my father had Alzheimer's. And I was trying to go to school. So I threw myself into school, right, basically. And I was pretty badly bullied by people in school because I was different. I was a Caribbean person. I spoke with an accent. They called me names. Uh, I didn't fit in. I was in a very prominent prep school and people were very mean. So I felt very isolated and I kind of just, I was always very smart, but I uh, just threw myself into school and committed to that, I think. So I dug in. And my mother was always very supportive of any aspirations I had, maybe a little bit too much uh, in that direction, like be an actress, be famous, be a model. You know, you can do it all, (laughs) that sort of rhetoric, right? So I, I did for a while. And then I dropped the modeling and the acting and the dancing. And I did like five sports. I mean, I just did everything (laughs) basically. Um, So that's a little background. I'm going to pause for a second because I just said so much. Huh. Given that background, I can totally see why you would focus on your career more. Mm -hmm. I think that the more struggle a woman goes through, the more likely she is to want a career just because she sees it as some kind of security where Mm -hmm. she feels that she can't depend on a husband or a father and she should have an income of her own whereas in my experience women who are more feminine in the sense they didn't have to go through extreme amounts of struggle and didn't get brainwashed Mm -hmm. typically trust men a bit more Yes, I I agree. The more trauma, hardship, adversity uh, a young woman goes through, I mean, I think that obviously is going to be difficult for her to overcome. I mean, I had a strong male figure in my life. My father and my brother were stalwarts. I mean, I loved them dearly. I was very much like them. So when I lost them, that was a bit... um, you know, that was difficult for me, but it's, so that's different. I didn't, it's not that I didn't have that in my life. I did, but then I lost them. And I think part of the reason why I got distracted or sort of, um, I don't know, I guess it's, I didn't really hear a lot of encouragement to find the right husband and develop my own family, like that was never an emphasis uh, in my household. I mean, love, yes, like the flowery stuff, (laughs) but not not really, you know, an encouragement to put aside all the aspirations and, uh, yeah, nurture a family, bring children into the world. That, That wasn't something that I heard a lot. And it wasn't obviously heard a lot in school or by my peers getting married, you know, romantically like, oh, yes, the wedding day, like all of that. Yes, but not really the whole package. And I think a lot of people uh, did not did not have that encouragement either. I think nowadays it's even worse, isn't it, where people are told that children are a huge financial liability and then you shouldn't have kids because then you lose your freedom and you lose a lot of money and i i know for a fact that a lot of my friends in the west didn't have kids because of how afraid they were about how expensive it they would be mm-hmm. and they didn't want to lose a lot of freedom and take on all these responsibilities so i think the culture itself plays a huge role because i have friends from say the middle east and even here in india who don't think that way, who think that women should have children, including the women, they they want to be mothers. So I think the cultural aspect really does play a role. Mm -hmm. It's so important. And I think, too, that feeling connected to family and having those resources and support 
it helps to subdue your anxieties about it. I know myself and a lot of my friends growing up and becoming mature women, you would feel like you would have to do it all on your own. And so it would deter people from that responsibility and that expense if you didn't have a close-knit family. And, and you might be close emotionally or theoretically with your family, but families got split up in my generation or, or at least my cohort, right? Everyone lived somewhere else. So my mother lives in Miami. My sister lives in Vancouver. I live in Arizona. So we're all over the, well, at least this part of the world. And that was very common for a lot of the people I grew up around. I think because I'm also from a very small island country and people left to go to school or develop their whatever it is that they were focusing on, whether it was school or um, talents or work opportunities. So you would have your your immediate family and your family of origin, your extended family all over the world. And that made it very difficult, I think, to focus on I mean, getting those roots and bringing children into your life because it is a lot. It is a lot to do on your own as, you know, the nuclear family system. You need to have that extended aspect, that net of support. Makes sense. So what was your experience like? Let's say when you were 21, you were pursuing your PhD and studying and then working on your career. Mm -hmm. Why, uh, for example, if I, if I may ask, like, why did you not say at some point decide, okay, I, I'm done with my education. Maybe I should say focus on finding a husband and having children. So what, um, how did the thinking process go? I'm, I'm just trying to understand where this comes from. Sure. I'm trying to go back there in my mind too. So <laughs> give me a minute. I went to school in New Orleans. I did my bachelor's from 97 to 2001. And I'm a very determined person. <laughs> I, I want to do my best. I want to go all the way. I, you know, I have that, that drive in me, have, have always had that drive in me. Um, so there was, the finish line was in mind, right? Like I didn't want to stop. Like I wanted to keep going and go as far as I could go. So it made sense to me to just keep going to school until completion. And I obviously I would have uh, boyfriends and the emphasis was never on the relationship or settling down. Um, and it didn't end up working out. Obviously, I didn't know then what I know now, how to vet <laughs> and how to uh, just really prioritize developing the relationship um, so that that future would come to fruition. So it was mostly a very individualistic mindset that I was in. And I was just, I had, what do you call it? Like <laughs> I was, I had the bone in my mouth and I wasn't letting it go. You know, uh, I wanted to, ah. to accomplish that PhD and be Dr. Burroughs after my father. Honestly, that was one of the very sentimental, perhaps silly things that drove me is that I wanted to make him proud. Hmm. Interesting. But did you not have the whole feeling, you know, a lot of the women that I know, they go through this phrase all the time where if they don't have kids or they aren't married, every single birthday is a bit of a crisis for them, especially after 25. And, you know, the women are wired to want babies. So they have episodes where if they since they're, they're not mothers yet, if they see a baby, they really want one and they feel sad that they don't have one yet. I don't know that that's true for all women. Um, not that women aren't wired to. I agree with the biological drive, but the social imprinting that we get counters baby that. Baby fever. Yeah. I did not want kids. I did not want babies. I thought babies were great. I, I'm very good with children, have always been. But I never wanted children. That was not like a, a sentiment that I had. I wanted to be married. I wanted to be loved. I, you know, in that 
sort of, I guess it's like a selfish way, right? Like you wanted the bells and whistles of finding the love of your life and, and all that. I mean, it's not like I planned my wedding from early or anything like that, but it definitely was more of my focus about, um, being chosen and being loved and, and more so about that. And I think too, the birth control pill obviously played a big role in all of our lives. I was on birth control, uh, at, during college. And I think that having that, uh, normalized made you feel a false sense of control. If I'm speaking to the subconscious, like sub communication of what was happening, I think it was, if you can control not getting pregnant, you should be able to control getting pregnant when you're ready. As if, you know, it's just like a switch that you turn on and off. Interesting. Yeah. What are your thoughts on the pill itself? I think that the birth control pill is not great for women's health and that normalizing it is really not that good. Um, I, one sec, I think we lost Taylor. Can you not hear me? Question mark. Hey, sorry about that, guys. We had some technical issues, but we are back. So like I was asking Taylor earlier, Taylor, what are your thoughts on the pill itself? Because from my perspective, I think the pill is bad for women's health and normalizing it has not been good for women. It has actually been bad because not only does it like mess up the woman's body in the long run, but it also changes their way of thinking from sex is something that is important and sacred to something that can just be done for pleasure, like drinking a Coke. <laughs> uh, that has basically had a lot of women destroy their own pair bonding ability by having sex with lots of men. And then at some point, not being able to bond with anyone. Uh, you, I think you and I have had a, a brief conversation about this. Uh, my views around the pair bonding impairment is a, a little bit different, a little bit more nuanced than that. Um, if you want me to go into my opinion. Yeah, of course. Okay. So I agree that a person, <clears throat> a woman in this, in this instance, who can't properly securely attach to a, a man in a relationship is wounded. And if she perpetuates casual sexual relations or dating, then that is indicative of some kind of instability or dysfunction, distress. Uh, whether she is conscious of it or not and actively chooses this or by default following kind of social norms is participating in this behavior. I do agree that it's important for a woman to be selective and be sexually active uh, minimally in order to maintain her virtue, value, and health. And hopefully, you know, that ends up being with her spouse for the rest of her life. And, you know, people have different values around waiting for marriage or having just a few experiences that didn't work out before they find that person. So yes, numbers should be low, but I don't see it as just a result, like a direct result of like the previous number of partners. And I know there's the study that everybody quotes, but what I think is more important is having that behavior uh, reflects that there's something wrong, like emotionally, there is some something there that I, as a you know retired therapist, I would want to explore with the person. Why are they doing that behavior? Whatever it is that they experienced or whatever is wrong with their you know inability to regulate their behavior and their emotions is the problem not necessarily just number of partners, if you understand the nuance there. So what I emphasize with people, is, and, and I work mostly with male clients, it, it's not the sexual history of the woman, but vet her for her recent past. Like if you talk about the last two years, you don't want to choose someone who adopts casual dating behaviors, dating multiple partners at a time. Like even if it's, you know, 
you, you might not be sexually active with everybody, but maybe you have some level of physical affection with someone and then you're having sex with somebody else and then you're meeting somebody else for coffee. <laughs> you know, there's, that's the, the modern acceptable uh, way that people go about dating these days. That to me is more indicative of pair bonding difficulty because you have confused attachment. You're attached to, it's like polyamory or, you know, heading towards that direction. But if you look at a woman who may, let's say she had, I don't know, like 15 sexual partners overall, but in the past two to five years, she has not been uh, sexually active and she has only been focused on developing herself or she's maybe been in serial sort of monogamous relationships appropriately, not like a quick turnaround with multiple people, but just maybe had a boyfriend. It didn't work out. 15 times though. Pardon? 15 times. Yeah, no, but that's what I'm saying. It's like, I wanted to pick a number that was high enough that it would, (laughs) you know, be upsetting, but I I want, I want to relay that. Okay. If you're 25, 15 partners is going to be more significant, but if you're 40, 15 partners is not going to be that uncommon in this part of the world. Yeah. I suppose there is a cultural gap. Yeah. But uh, that the point is, I don't want you to fixate on the number, right? I know, I know, I know. I'm just like, I, I was just poking fun at it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to focus on like the behavior and the reasons why that has happened. And it's more important to see like that it has been um, like a recent, like in her, not just rem- like recent, but uh, I would say two years minimum is usually the cutoff of how has she been behaving for the past two plus years and not necessarily obsessing about the total number. But that's a, that's going to be different to pay, based on your cultural background and your value system, for sure. Hmm, I get where you're coming from about that. Personally, I think that zero is the best number <laughs> and one is too high for me, <laughs> unless that one was me. <laughs> but I think that's like we're getting into the, into the territory of, you know, advising men. Um, I think uh, th- this podcast, I would say, like, I want to talk about what's, uh, you know, what a woman should do with her life in the sense that even though, let's say, I, let's say, like, like you said, like a woman with 15 partners might still be an acceptable partner for some man. But it, I w- I'm sure you would agree that having 15 partners, like having had 15 partners is not a good experience for for the woman in the first place. And she should ideally be smart enough in like vetting the right men earlier than that. Would you, would you agree with that? Absolutely. That's what I'm in the business for is helping hopefully younger women figure this out to, to prevent that problem from happening. I remember you once said that you made a lot of mistakes in your life and that you were trying to save other women from making mm-hmm. the same mistakes. So could you give us, say, um, a brief history of Taylor Burroughs and... <laughs> what sure. did you learn what are your regrets and what things you're glad you did absolutely and you're you're fine but just in case anybody else is listening you can say my last name is burrows you don't have to pronounce the e so much oh i'm sorry <laughs> that's okay no 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 um my life trajectory i guess like what i regret most is my divorce so that is um Mostly what I'm referencing is committing to my career and deferring my personal life to the point where I became a little bit impatient or urgent or rushing the process when I did get to, I think it was about 30, right? Like when I hit 30 and I made some, like I moved back to the Cayman Islands and I started building my 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 career and work living on my own and all of that was happening. I started taking the idea of finding a husband more seriously. And I didn't know the vetting process then. So I picked someone who was not a good match for me, despite, you know, all the positives. And it became quickly apparent after the wedding, unfortunately, that that was the case. And then I was looking down a very narrow view of my future and I decided that I needed to 
get divorced so that I could figure out what I had wrong and fix it and start over and pray and do everything that I could to make sure that I made all the right choices from then on. And so I think I was 36 when we got divorced. So that's a pretty late age to get it right. Hmm. So how come you never got married in your 20s? Why did you wait till you were 30? Or what was the thought process there? I, well, there was a boyfriend in college in particular that I took pretty seriously. Um, but it ended badly, like after five years. So we were together for five years. And he ended up um, with another woman and they got married. So, you know, with every experience like that, it takes a while to regroup and there can be a lot of emotional upheaval and distress that distracts you, right? Like you have to work through the baggage when you have a significant relationship go south. And at that time, I would say my father died when I was 24, 25, and I moved back home with my mother And that was a very difficult transition. And I started my PhD program and that was very intensive and I started working. So it just takes a lot of your time. You have no time for anything else, (laughs) right? And then by the time you finish your program, it's like you're 30. Ah, so things got in the way basically. So would you agree that it was not like a priority for you back then? No, my priority was accomplishing uh, these goals and and it's expensive, right? Like every year I would have to take a loan out for $20,000. So it was serious business. <laughs> That's a lot of money for yeah. education. So if you were say 20 again, Taylor, what would you do differently? What would you prioritize first and once you are done with that, I would also love to hear what mistakes you made when you were picking your first partner, the one you divorced, and Mm -hmm. what would you like to avoid or what you would like women to avoid and how can women, you know, vet a guy? Because, like, you know, with LMM, I typically give guys advice on how to vet women. Like, but it isn't, I I rarely ever talk about what to look for in a man. Mm -hmm. So it, it would be interesting to hear your experience. Absolutely. But you you just listed off several of very questions. good questions. So let's let's bookmark them and make sure that I respond to all of them. Um, so the, the first, first one mm-hmm. is, um, if you were 20 again, what would yes. you do differently? What would you prioritize? What would you not prioritize, et cetera? Sure. I would, if, if I were my own mother and I could go back, I would advise me to consciously plan as much as possible, like what I wanted and how I could get it. I never really did that reverse engineering process. I was on the conveyor belt, like, you know, you, you start and you just keep going and it's a very reactive mindset where you don't uh, necessarily plan the whole thing from the end backwards and being able to identify what matters most to you what you value, what you prioritize, and seeing how they fit together. That would have been very eye-opening for me, right? And I'm sure my father would have done that if he had his mental capacities, right? But he, he, you know, he, he wasn't there. So I didn't have that from my mother or my sister. And I'm not blaming them. I'm just saying I didn't have it from them. And I didn't do it myself, which I could have, but I don't think I was in a very practical mindset at the time. Um, so having that that intentionality with organizing my future and not assuming everything would just fall into place, like you can do anything you want, everything, you know, it was just the mindset that I was I was ingrained with. And if I had just like realized that fertility was limited, and things had to happen at a certain point, I may have moved things around. Like I may have gotten my undergraduate degree 
uh, and then maybe figured out a, a different plan of like focusing more on, I mean, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. So I was trying to figure out exactly how I would be making an income and, and what I would be doing for work. That was, you know, my, my focus was to be academic and, and have that sort of clout. Right. But if, if I had done some volunteering work, like, I mean, I did when I was younger, but if I had really prioritized, um, more of my own life and getting healthy, that would have been the best way forward. Because as I say to people and whether I'm working with them or just out there in the internet, I advise people to get healthy first. You, you can't really get a good result in your relationships if you're not starting with a good product, right? <laughs> you're not going to give True. value to somebody else's life if you're a mess. And that's where you get the sort of rhetoric of like, accept me how I am, all my flaws and all, you would just want to be loved. So I was a bit, and, and I thought I was a pretty good package. You know, I was very pretty. I was very smart. I was very successful. I had all these things going for me, but inside I was a bit messy, you know, like I felt sad and I was grieving and I had experienced trauma. And I've talked about the trauma a bit, like uh, in my doctorate, in my TEDx, I admitted that I had experienced sexual trauma as a younger girl and all of that was going on. So there was so many things happening inside and I tried to seek counseling, but it didn't work out. So I was trying to deal with it by sort of stuffing it you know, and throwing myself into all this work and all of this, you know, busyness. And uh -uh. if I, does that make more sense? Like if I had really prioritized and had the support to resolve, resolve all of that, I would have been in a healthier state of mind to make better decisions. Hmm. So what better decision would you have made? Like what, if say someone was Taylor Burrow, Burroughs, uh, sorry, um, <laughs> That's at okay. 25 years old and Taylor Burroughs, 25 years old, has the option of say either spending a lot of time with her career or option two which is focus on finding the right guy and getting married having children and sidelining the career a bit and doing that much later in life when she is more settled with her family and children so what path would you recommend someone a girl pick today mm -hmm. yeah it's it's so hard to because it's hard to do both. And anyone who thinks they can do both is <laughs> lying to themselves or lying to whomever they're talking to. Because Absolutely. <laughs> it's like, you know, working in investment banking mm -hmm. or like working a job where you are sitting on a computer for 14, 15 hours a day and, you know, eating junk food all day. And also thinking, hey, I can do this job <laughs> and be very fit at the same time. It is technically possible, but come on, like it's for most people, it's not. So what are your thoughts on this? I uh, know I agree with you. I've, I wrote and I think I shared with you a recent uh, newsletter on the topic and I've done some reels on it. it. You can't do it all at once and expect it all to just work out neatly. You have to optimize and leverage the opportunities that you have at the right time. So I would advise any younger woman to prioritize that time period, you know, in their 20s to clarify themselves, their own personal lives. And it doesn't mean you have to, you know, go out there and, and hire a matchmaker or go through um, the sort of marriage screening process. But if you don't develop yourself on that level where your, your family relationships are healthy, your self-care practices, your discipline, all the things that I talked about in the red flag list this week, right? Like doing the affirmative of all of those things. You have to make sure you're kind and you're graceful and that you are humble and that you're able to, to present yourself in a stable, happy, healthy perspective in order to meet your future husband. So it, it, I think people get this wrong. They're like, well, what am I going to do? I'm just going to go and like accept invitations for 
marriage when I'm 20 to 30. I'm like, no, you have to really make sure that you are in a place where you're ready and prepared. You have to mature. You have to develop your critical thinking skills. You have to learn how to be selective, how to vet and all of those things. But when you ask me going back, see, this is the thing when you talk to an older woman who's been through it and has regrets, oftentimes there was no, there was no other way to, to navigate life experiences given all the factors, right? So the regrets are in hindsight, yeah, I wish I had this and I wish I had that. But if you ask me, would I have, what, you know, would I have done anything different than move back in with my mother and deal with all the craziness of her grief for several years? No, like the best choice at the time was for me to move in with her and deal with her. Um, I didn't have time to really deal with myself. Right. So, I mean, it's very hard to cherry pick those experiences and, and figure out how to do them, how you could have done them better. But the point is to prevent yourself from having those regrets and to try to clarify your life in your own terms. If you have this opportunity coming at it from being, you know, 16, 17, 18 years old, if you don't have healthy role models, if you don't have someone who is really supporting that stability and nurturing, you know, more of those wholesome qualities, you have to find some role models that are going to do that for you uh, so that you have something to emulate. It's very hard to spontaneously come up with all of this on your own if you're not seeing it demonstrated to you in your life. Mm. I think on that note, religion plays a good role. Religion has a lot of great role models. Mm -hmm. at least the hinduism and the religious stories we have in india for example sita is the ideal wife ram is the ideal man etc so i think religion does play a big role it's very interesting what you said earlier though where you said that you can't have it all at once and i think that a lot of women today are lied to where i feel that women are told you can be a great career woman you can have like a career as the lawyer and uh, one sec you can have a career as a lawyer and you can find a husband children everything and what happens to people or at least a lot of the women that i know from my professional career is that they believe it at first and then they are shocked when they find out that it's not true and when they're 30 it ends up that at least here in india a woman who is 30 is considered old. And the type of guy, guy, a woman who is 30, 35 and successful in her career wants to marry. She wants a guy who makes more money, who is, you know, successful and older than her a bit. That's the type of guy who wants to marry a 23 year old. Mm -hmm. you, you see what I mean? So there is a, I feel that a lot of these women are victims or victims mm -hmm. of feminism where they were essentially lied to about what guys find valuable in women oh yeah like they were told that guys are guys think the same way they were told that guys will want you if you're successful when really uh, most guys just want you to be young and fertile and feminine mm -hmm. and the type of guys you will want as a woman because of hypergamy and you wanting something better is a type of guy who will definitely not want a 33 year old. Mm -hmm. So what are I, your thoughts on this? Have you faced this <laughs> with your clients? Um, the clients that I work with, and I do have actually a strong Indian uh, contingent in my, in my client roster. Uh, the guys that I work with generally are, are looking for a woman over 25. They're not, they're not looking for, um, you know, uh, that's my recommendation anyway. But if th they don't necessarily want a woman who's 33, no. So there's that that sweet spot <laughs> for a woman who is mature and grounded, but, you know, still in that range where she's got high fertility and she's youthful and, you know, you don't want her to be so fixed in her ways that she doesn't have space for your influence. So if someone who is in, in that um, period of life can be more amenable to and flexible to accommodating your beliefs or your lifestyle, right? And that going back to the question, though, it it's 
flexibility. If you're going to go to school as a woman and you're going to focus on, you know, helping to support the family, having a career, using your God-given gifts of intelligence and skill sets or whatever, which I encourage, it's the flexibility, the adaptability aspect that is not emphasized enough by families or society. A woman should seek some kind of work that will allow her space and time and the opportunity to prioritize her family. That would make a world of difference, which is why I advise women to maybe, you know, start their own business or work online so that they have that flexibility. So you don't have to marry a career that is so draining of your energy and attention. I agree with that. I think that one of the most important things a woman should focus on is building some kind of business that she can run from her home using the internet. Because this allows her to focus on her household duties, her husband and getting married and having children, while also not, you know, becoming someone who has no experience with real life. And a business is something that is going to ensure that she is continuously developing and also learning more things. And it is also going to provide some intellectual stimulation. Because most intelligent women will get really bored if they don't have some interaction with the outside <laughs> world. Fully agree with you there. That is the truth. And, uh, and online business is, is something that everyone should leverage if it's going to help help you get the most out of all of your priorities. Um, and some people don't have to work, but they want to work because, like you said, they need that intellectual stimulation or just I, I really think it's the God-given gifts that each person has. And when feminists oppose my viewpoint, I will explain to them that being a mother and nurturing a household is part of that. And that has to supersede all others. But there are women who are very talented and skilled at certain things and can be of service to the world. And they should have some kind of opportunity to provide that right? It's almost like a sin to not be able to uh, share that with the world, but you just have to figure out how without sacrificing the needs of your family. Agree. And moreover, I think it's a much better income model than working a job, especially for a woman, because when you work a job, you have to be away from home eight, nine hours a day. You're really tired. And by the time you get home, your energy levels are already low. and then you can't really give any of your quality time to your family and children. Absolutely. Whereas when, with, the, with the business, you can adjust your hours how you want it to be. In my experience, that's exactly right. Um, and that's why I say a woman can't be married to her career. It's not about not working. It's about seeing it as your primary relationship. And when you are committed to a career to that extent, you end up giving your best to your work, your boss, <laughs> your responsibilities there, and you give your worst to your home life, your family, your husband. I see. So let's proceed to the previous, another question from, you know, what we bookmarked. What would you recommend a girl look for in a guy and i would also love to hear about the mistakes that you have made in your own life including the divorce that happened to you because as you said earlier that you were dating but then you said that you found out you were not compatible after you got married so mm -hmm. what did you not look for when you were dating that you discovered later when you were married and how did that come to be in the sense that how did you not realize this was earlier Sure. Yeah. Um, health was a very important factor. It's one of my, my core values. And I, I didn't, I didn't want to see perhaps because it was clear that he was not as aligned with health and fitness and, and all of that as, as I was, but I didn't see how incompatible it was to you know, sort of overlook those things. And 
it's not just an aesthetic thing. It's a lifestyle thing, right? Like it's definitely something that is very important to me and it's the basis of everything else. <laughs> so, um, it was, it was definitely, it also includes like mental health. So not just physical health and fitness and diet, but mental health and the way that you, um, behave and things like that. So all of that wrapped into one. I don't want to go too far into specifics, but the other thing was family values and lifestyle. Uh, we have very different ways, like, you know, I guess preferences or the way the culture that a family is very different. And this seems obvious maybe, maybe to you and a lot of your listeners who come from a culture that's very, I would say, um, emphasizes family support and family culture and community and all that sort of stuff. But, uh, it just didn't align, you know, like the things that they, their, his family did were not things that I enjoyed and there was no space for anything else. Um, and it has to do, I think also with that core value around health. So the family, very extensive family, none of them are really healthy. So a lot of their activities were of that, you know, a lifestyle that I couldn't really buy into. So if I couldn't buy into his family's lifestyle and his family was very prominent in his life and I would be bringing children into that culture, I realized this was a bad match and the future was looking very bleak. So I hope that answers your question. I'm really trying to tiptoe around not not speaking <laughs> ill of anybody. All right. I have one related question and you're free to not answer it. Um, but the question is, since you knew this person beforehand, why did you marry him? And I'm asking this because a lot of women, when they're in love, you know, when once they're dating, they have affection for someone or, you know, even guys do the same thing where they start rationalizing f the faults of the other person and they start negotiating with themselves what they should not negotiate. And then once they're already married, they realize that, yeah, they really should have just been more logical. Sure. The things that were the redeemable aspects that I emphasized and focused on, my rose-colored glasses, I like to say, they were focused on his love for me. He was very much head over heels in love for me. So I felt safe. I felt that I could trust his loyalty and he could create that security in that, and in, in not just in a financial way, but that was included at the time when we were, when, when we were dating, he was quite financially secure. Um, things changed and things were revealed that countered that narrative. But, um, beyond that, it was the emotional security that I was very, very much attracted to because of my sort of, you know, the loss and the grief and the, the trauma that I had experienced, uh, really was a wounded, you know, girl that was seeking someone to love her and accept her and make her feel safe. Um, so he did, he did have that. Um, and there were those redeemable aspects to it. But like I said, the vetting and the compatibility, all those other logical components, which is part of my formula, right? For ideal relationships, it's logic plus desire plus love equals an ideal relationship. W you know, we didn't have that aspect. I see. So a related and a very important question for you here, I think would be, so what exactly would you recommend a woman look for in a man? What is negotiable and what is non-negotiable? And what, in your experience with your own life and also with your clients, ends up breaking a lot of marriages? Well, the nuance here, though, is the way that I approach it. It is an, an individualized, customized program, right? I yeah. don't prescribe some kind of projection of an ideal man or an ideal woman with my clients. Uh, I know, I, I know. So what I'm asking is, for example, if mm -hmm. there are a certain list of red flags which you could or I could like come up with, for example, a guy who is an alcoholic and violent, violent, is probably someone you should not marry. You know what I mean? So sure. What? <laughs> so, Harsh, what? did you see my red flag list this week? I did, I did. I okay. shared it on Twitter. 
Yeah, yeah. It's uh, there is a I've I've done many of those lists, but there's definitely some of the objective, fundamental aspects, and if that's what you're speaking to, yes. Okay. Yeah. Because it, it, I, but people get this wrong all the time. It's like, there's not just one type of person that you're looking for, but you need to make sure that they're healthy, they're happy and they're stable. And that looks a little bit different for, for men and for women. Right. So for a man to be healthy, he's going to have to have a lot more control of his emotions. Right. Whereas a woman, yeah, she needs to self-regulate, but she's an, a, an emotional creature. So she's not going to be as stoic as a man is. Then she becomes more masculine. So it does differ depending on which, uh, you know, if we're talking about men or women, but a man should be secure. He should have his finances in order. Whereas for a woman, it's not as important for her to be, yes, you want her to be you know, good with money, but she doesn't have to be financially well off and she doesn't have to be successful in her career. Whereas the man should have that ability to be the head of household and take care and support a family with lots of children. So if he doesn't have that ability, he, he doesn't have to be at the finish line, but he should be building and demonstrate the skills that are needed for him to develop all of those things, for example. Okay. So First one would what do you you'd say is potential financially and emotionally and health wise? Yeah, and health and fitness is a, a you know obviously very important. You want to have a, a strong, robust, capable man uh, to lead your family to to protect you under duress, any kind of threat to the family, right? So you need to have someone who is strong physically as well and capable. <laughs> so whether that's, uh, you know, he's got some, some training in combat or he has some ability, he's not going to cower in that moment. He's going to be able to defend your honor and the safety of your family. So he does have to have that assertiveness and be able to lead really well uh, himself first and foremost, but then also in complicated situations. He has to demonstrate that he is a good leader. Okay. <laughs> uh, I would say as well, obviously looks are important. So I, I, I don't want to overlook that, but that's just, it's subjective. So it's hard to, to qualify that specifically. Uh, taller is better. <laughs> taller is better, but I've been putting out a lot of, of content lately where it, it's not a deal breaker. It, it's an, it's a negotiable depending on, you know, how much we're talking about, but I've seen a lot of examples of couples of like, Women who are 6'2 with men who are like 5'7 and 5'8. And the, they seem to be happily in love and in a healthy relationship. So it's not that it can't happen. But generally, as like a stereotype, sure, a woman wants a man to be taller than her. But it's not, it's not necessarily a deal breaker. Uh, it's not necessarily. But my recommendation to women is to go for someone who's tall so that your children are tall. Yeah, to improve the genes. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, I, I know what you mean. I was definitely uh, that was what That's I was good. brought into <laughs> that belief system. But I think you know it is subjective. So ultimately, health is the biggest indicator, and that also goes to just grooming. Right. So if a man can be disciplined, which that's definitely on the list, a man who is disciplined is going to take care of the way that he looks. He's going to take care of of his wardrobe, of his hair and his skin and all of that sort of stuff, too, so that he presents really well. And I think that is attractive to women to know that a man has that type of, of relationship with himself. Hmm. Are there any particular personality personality traits that you think don't work so well? For example, I can say that there are a lot of men today who are also, in a sense, I would say horse. And my recommendation, if I had a daughter, I would not let my daughter marry a guy who was a whore. So what are your thoughts on these matters where, for example, let what are the traits in men that typically become a negative once the man is married? I, I'm Maybe I'm missing the reference that you're saying, actually, too. So I, could you repeat or explain what that, the hearse, what is that? A whore, the, in the sense that a guy who sleeps around way too much, oh. a pickup artist type of person. Gotcha, yes. 
definitely. I, I, I don't advise my female clients, um, to go after the bad boy. And I did a, I did a nice, uh, email on the difference between a badass <laughs> and an asshole, because that gets confused a lot. Whereas, you know, the common dating coach narrative is that women want a, a, an asshole and so treat her in this bad way. But that's not true. Women don't want that. Women want a man of good character who has honor and integrity and treats her well, but she wants a man who has that that badassness, right? So he has that. Yes, exactly. You, you, you have to cultivate that. If you don't have a good, integrated, healthy relationship with your masculinity, that's going to be more of a, an, like an effeminate kind of uh, presence that you carry, and it's going to turn off feminine women. Yeah. In fact, from my own experience, if you are masculine and good, that's the best you can be for women. All women want that. And typically the cultural thing nowadays is that some guys, I would say, think that being extremely nice and wimpy and a, you know, a male feminist type is, like, that's what they're trying to become. But really, girls would rather go out with assholes than to go out with a wimp. I mean, like, if you have to choose between the two, yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> if we're being honest, it is how it is. Because women want masculinity. So I think, yeah, that's that's an important factor for guys to develop. But it's not that it's not that simple, right? Like there there's a lot in between that. And that's what I focus on with with clients is finding that sweet spot and integrating that healthy balance with you. So you, you don't want to have to choose between one or the other. You want to create that nice blend of both masculinity and femininity or the qualities that are derivative of that inside yourself, right? Because you don't want a man who has no compassion. He's got to create comfort for the woman. So you have to have those emo that emotional intelligence in, in order to you know make a woman feel safe and secure and bring out her vulnerability. I see. So let me pivot a little bit. Mm -hmm. In my experience with talking to a lot of women online, I have about 50K followers who are women. A lot of them who wait too long to get married and end up marrying much later in life, say at 33-ish, 35-ish, they typically find it very difficult to have children and they end up, they have fertility issues basically. So what is your advice to women in that regard? Is there a particular age after before which they're like much more likely to have children? And if 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 a woman does want to have more than or if she wants to have like a couple of children or even if a single child, what age should she prioritize marriage to be? Assuming she wants to be married for two, three years before she has a child. I, I like the 25 year uh, mark for women. I think between 25 and 27, it's when their, the, you know, the brain development is really solidified and they've hap had an opportunity to go to school and explore their hobbies, their interests, get healthy. So that I think, I mean, obviously you can start to vet when you're in your early twenties and perhaps, you know, get into a relationship, but for marriage and really settling down, I would say that's a really good age to target. Uh, it just hits the sweet spot and start to have, try to have children. Like it's a lot easier to have children when you're 30. So that would be the goal, I think, for most women that in the timeline. If you're going to, you know, reverse engineer your life, shoot for that. Mm. I agree with you definitely over there. I think that a lot of women have too much faith in IVFs and, they think that even if they're really old, they will find a way to have kids. But a lot of them are just, well, they they are in for a shock. And a lot of them are really, really shocked when they find out they can't have kids anymore. Yes. And and it also puts a, a, a sense of urgency into the, you know, vetting process to find a partner so that your judgment will be off because you're in a rush, right? I had this one client who gave me permission to share a little bit of her story, anonymously, of course, but she came to me about a little over a year ago and she was 44, single, 
and she had frozen her eggs and she was thinking about using them and becoming a single mother. But she was conflicted because she really wanted to find her ideal partner. So she wanted to give it one last shot, the, the natural way, and, and wanted to test fate. So I had, a, I had a hard time at first, you know, getting her to get out of the, the modern dating, dating app sort of <laughs> uh, strategy and learning the vetting system so that she could be more intentional about who she was getting to know and um, vetting them for an ideal partnership. How old was she? She was 44 at the time. Now ah. she's, I think, five. But it ended up actually quite uh, remarkable that she was able to find someone and get engaged and she's pregnant. So in in about a year, uh, she was able to do all of those things naturally on her own. That's incredible. How common is that? How common is it for a 44-year-old woman to be able to conceive naturally? It's not it's not easy at all. I'm I think it's a real blessing that she's been able to so far carry this uh this child and more women I think assume that this can just happen like in the blink of an eye like when they're ready. But what I'm trying to emphasize is the sense of panic and the sense of urgency. It, once you are in your late 30s, um, you start to become more desperate and it's very easy to just cop out and settle for something convenient to try to get what you want most in the world. So it will it will cause you to accept, you know, relationships that are unhealthy or men that are or or you know, relationships that are just not compatible. And in order to have a baby. And even then it's not guaranteed that it's going to be an easy road. It could be very expensive. I mean, luckily I think she had, um, financial wealth in order to support all of the things that she had to do. But the regular, you know, woman who is maybe not in that position and has to struggle with that, it just adds on to the difficulty of getting pregnant and creating that family. If you wait too late. Hmm. I see. What are the success rates for these treatments like? Do you know? Because I've heard at the age of 45, your chances of naturally getting pregnant and delivering a live baby are like 1% or less. I don't know the statistics on it, but um, I mean, I just know that basically you're biologically very limited and you need support in order to produce just the basic, like going to the follicles that will, you know, mature the egg and carry it to fertilization and all of that sort of stuff. So you might not know because you're totally healthy in every other way, but your sex organs are in the geriatric category and that there's nothing really that you can do about that no matter how how well you live your life so you have to consider the timeline above all else and not wait until you know your your system is heading towards expiration ha huh. So I remember like, coming across a study where it said that a lot of women themselves are not unaware of the fact that their fertility doesn't really depend too much on their good health. And that means that is to say that a lot of women were assuming that if they are in good health, they will be fertile for much, much longer. When really, if they are in bad health, they will be less fertile. But if they are in good health, it doesn't mean that they will be fertile for longer than the normal period. No. Yeah, I, th I think people just assume it's going to be easier to get pregnant than it is. I don't know if they think like they'll be fertile for more years because nobody really anticipates when menopause is going to happen. So they know it's just a gamble once you cross 40, like how long you have before you, you reach that stage of life um, because there is early onset of that. I think more women need to get uh, checked out for their fertility at a much younger age uh, or just making sure that their reproductive cycle is healthy and functioning properly because there are all those you know younger girls that have those those problems uh, gynecological problems that interfere with their health but also um, getting them optimized for fertility hmm. 
I've heard of a few things called PCOD and PCOS, which a lot of young girls have nowadays. Um, are you aware of that? Yes, I've I've had several clients who have complained of that. So what can be done about that and why does it happen? What can girls do to avoid getting PCOD, PCOS? Well, I'm definitely not a specialist in that area, but I've I've heard it's it's very reliant on your diet. There's something about the the insulin levels that it's related to. So if if you re- consult with someone who is specialized in that, um, maybe outside of the traditional gynecological realm, then you can focus on some of those dietary changes that could really help, which is important. Makes sense. Makes complete sense. All right, Taylor. So what is something else that you wish more women knew or more women cared for or understood? So what are your, say, lessons for young women? The way I was thinking about this is, you know, having a a daughter of my own, how would I raise her, right? Uh, I would definitely want to learn from my experiences and improve upon them. So it's not always about looking back and regretting the choices that you made given the, you know, the best choices that you could have made given the situations, but how could you improve upon it for the next generation? And, you know, bringing a, a young woman into the world, it's really important for her to value the role of her father and to learn how to respect and have all those basic family values. I talked about this in a recent video too, about the 11, I think it was, uh, I forget how many questions, but the lessons for uh, a young woman to learn and apply in her life so that she doesn't have regrets. Um, but I don't remember all of them off the top of my head, but having that that those role models is one of the first things because it teaches you secure attachment and you carry those dynamics throughout the rest of your adult life. And women who don't have a healthy father figure in her, in their lives, they really are, are sort of handicapped in their relationships. So that's definitely number one. But I think overall, it's just being really focused, like I said before, on being intentional, being healthy, making sure that you develop whatever uh, practical skills you can, whatever talents you have in a way that is of service to your family, to your community, to the world. And looking at some of these like legacy issues, I think men have have a leg up in this way because men are much more mission focused. And so they think further down the road about, uh, you know, what they want to achieve when they're, you know, when they're in their right minds. I think there are obviously men that don't, but women don't always think about uh, the implications of things. And so if they can think, have more critical thinking, learn how to regulate their emotions, have a balance of that femininity and masculinity, that reason and emotion, that, that is probably one of the most most beneficial traits that they can have and, you know, figure out what it is that matters to them. What are those core principles and values that will guide them in their lives and really consider family at the core of existence. You know, it's so important to be of service and, and it's okay to, you know, have a sense of duty. Um, I think, you know, honor, integrity, duty, service, all of those things can come across as very weak uh, to some people. And obviously you want to have competence and you want to be assertive and, and all of those qualities as well. But we need to learn how to put ourselves aside sometimes and really just benefit like the family or the community and fight against that modernity that is encouraging us to be individualistic uh, to the extreme and learn how to think for yourself and make, make those things uh, more balanced in a balanced, healthy perspective. I see you mentioned something very important, learning how to control and regulate your emotions. And I think for women, it's much harder to do because they have much stronger emotions or they are more affected by emotions than men are. So Mm -hmm. what is your advice to women in that regard? How can they control their emotions better? Well, cognitive behavioral therapy is really effective for this. I find it very useful. What is that? uh, Well, generally speaking, it's 
understanding the connection between your thoughts, your feelings, and your behaviors, and having some agency in interrupting the automatic involuntary process that you may be unconscious of and making it a more conscious process. So for example, something happens and like the event, the triggering event happens, you have automatic thoughts that interpret the situation. So if that interpretation defers to something negative uh, or something that is like, it's just a a bad, a bad interpretation for how it impacts your, you know, your thoughts, your feelings and your behaviors. So it could be insecurity. It could be, um, some kind of neurosis, right? Uh, Oftentimes social media triggers people a lot. So if you see something online from a friend of yours and you interpret it as subtweeting or or referencing some kind of argument or discussion you had, then how are you going to feel about that? You're probably going to feel hurt or irritated. And then how are you going to behave? How are you going to be different with that friend? Are you going to sulk all day? So if instead you interpret the event differently, then it will result in a different feeling and a different action as in the outcome, right? So that's how you, one, identify your thoughts, identify your feelings, because we do need to label them. Oftentimes people don't even know how to label their feelings. They have low uh, emotional literacy. And then understanding the origin of them. Like, where did this come from? Oh, I saw this thing and it made me think this, which is why I feel this way. (laughs) If you see the link, then it becomes easier. So it's really just about um, drawing the, the, the connections between those things and how it's a system. Hmm. You know, I remember hearing this from someone who is really, really good at controlling emotions. They meditate a lot, but this is what they told me. They said that you have to be aware of your emotion in the in the sense that, for example, if you're feeling angry, if you don't recognize that you're angry, you're going to behave angrily. But you need to learn to recognize the emotion that you're feeling. And then you have to basically consciously tell yourself that just because I'm feeling this way does not mean I have to act this way. I am separate from my emotions and these are just guidelines and not a mandatory thing for me to do. Absolutely. Uh, we don't always control the the um, emotional response. We control the the action and the reaction that we have. So we want to be more proactive and taking that agency. I I like the the term regulation because it reminds me of like a thermostat, right? So if you're in a room and you control the thermostat, when you get cold, you turn it hotter. And when you get hot, you turn it colder. So think of your emotions in that way. You feel them uh, and it's okay to feel what you feel, especially given, you know, the circumstances, like if it's uh, a, a situation where it's, it's sad or angry, then it's okay to feel those emotions, but you want to regulate them, turning the dial so that you can get back to a comfortable baseline of functional, emotional, and behavior, right? So that's how I see it. And I, a lot of people, they assume that you have to to suppress your emotions, deny your emotions. Like that's the complaint about stoicism and why masculinity is so pathological in the APA's eyes that they try to stuff their feelings. But you don't, you don't uh, deny your feelings. You are able to identify and connect with them. So you have awareness of your emotions, but you just do not let them control your behavior. Absolutely. True. I think people misunderstand the concept of stoicism where they think it means emotional flatline. You're not supposed to feel anything where, for example, if you come and you start abusing me and that I'm supposed to be completely still and not affected at, affected at all. When in reality, I think stoicism is more like you can feel what you want to feel, but you have to act according to the situation. For example, sometimes you might feel really, really angry, but it might be in your best interest to not show the anger or to not show your irritation. For example, you might be with a customer, a client, or even your boss or someone like that. And they might be asking you some really stupid stuff and you're getting irritated, but you don't have to show the irritation. I think that's what emotional control is about and not a flat line, no response thing where you act like you, the emotion doesn't exist for you. Mm Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, absolutely. People get that wrong all the time. And then you hear, or at least I see it, I don't know if you see it, Harsh, tell me, uh, these accounts or sort of pseudo psychology, pop psychology, spirituality, Twitter, talking about how highly sensitive people are, are, you know, magical. I don't know. They kind of paint this picture glorifying them. But I, I get that emotions are a good thing and celebrating the femininity of women's emotionality is a positive thing, but you don't want to enable emotional dysregulation. You don't want to give people permission to be a basket case and say that's a good thing because they're in touch with their emotions. So it goes too far one way or the other, and you have to really learn how to, again, find that sweet spot. Yeah, I think women have more leeway in the sense that people typically expect women to behave a bit more emotionally so they don't mind it as much but if a woman can't control her emotions to the point where it starts becoming annoying then that's a massive negative for the woman because all of her other positives just get cancelled out because just she's just so annoying to be around right so she could be mm -hmm. the prettiest girl in the world but if she is super neurotic, she gets extremely annoyed and angry all the time, then you still would not want to be with her. I agree. I, I You have to have someone who um, can use their words, right? It's almost childlike if they can't. If they can't communicate effectively, then they're just being reactive. And that is immature behavior. So even with, if we treated children like that forever, you know, like while they were uh, in that developmental phase, they would never actually become mature and learn how to control their behavior. So if we, if we scaffold children in that way, we also have to scaffold women or whomever is emotionally dysregulated in that way as well. Agree with that. All right, Taylor, where can people find you? What is the best social media accounts that you have that you will use actively? And what is your website? Sure. Well, they can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, uh, at, usually at, at Taylor Burroughs. But my website is drtaylorburroughs.com. And I have a, a paid weekly newsletter, actually, which includes email coaching to process like personal and relationship matters confidentially and like one-to-one -one correspondence with me. But they can find all of my popular products and services at Linktree slash Taylor Burroughs. All of these links will be in the description. And is there something else you would like to mention right before we end it? Well, I feel like... You know, the main message that we wanted to to leave the listeners with today was about the importance of prioritizing, you know, your your fertility, especially, but ultimately that's so that you can have the the life of your dreams and develop that that marriage and that family um at a effectively. You know, you want to start at a, a really well, not really young, but you want to start at a good time so that you optimize both your emotions and your biology and your opportunities to get the most out of your life because, you know, we only have one in this lifetime anyway. Makes complete sense. You have only one life, so don't waste it and don't <laughs> mess it up. That's right. Do your best. Learn from people's mistakes. You don't have to repeat them. And uh, yeah, hopefully that's that's been imprinted on some of the listeners because I think it is different when it comes from a woman, especially who's living it herself and looking back and seeing what I could have done better. I mean, that's why we we share these stories is to to help people not make the same mistakes. Agree. I do think that if a lot of women take this podcast seriously, we might be in a much better situation from, you know, say 20 years from now than we are today. I hope so. That's the goal. I mean, we don't have to swing the pendulum all the way to the other side. I've actually, I know we're wrapping up, but the interesting conversation I had recently on my Instagram was about at what age should women get married? And 
<laughs> I know a lot of people encourage younger women to get married, like in their early 20s. But I think it's important to to make sure that a woman is ready for marriage and not to overcorrect the, the problem of women waiting too long to get married and have children by trying to encourage them too young into marriage. Because you have to be ready. You have to be mature and enough for the responsibility of marriage. And that may be 24, that may be 27. Uh, So you have to see what is right for the person. But ultimately, the point is you want to do it as early as possible for you when you're ready and not defer it, taking for granted that it's just going to all click later on when it's convenient for you. Yeah, the party does not start when you arrive. That's a deviation. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. (laughs) To put it simply. All right, Taylor, have a great day. I will catch you soon. See you on Twitter.